Today, I'm bringing in a man who was shot four times in the head, and I brought you his story about a month ago. This man is the creator of the Clear Belief System. He's a world-renowned author, psychologist, coach, speaker, Lion Goodman. Last time we talked about the Clear Beliefs Revolution, and today we're going to be talking about another passion of his, another child of his, creative child, the men's tribe. And so today we're going to be talking about the men's tribe revolution. I'm welcoming Lion Goodman. Thank Hi, you. Lion. Zulina. It's great to see you again. A pleasure to be here as always. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Thanks for, for coming back. Lion, I am not going to ask you to repeat the whole story. It was a very engaging story that you told us last time. So everybody go back and watch the Clear Beliefs Revolution on Heal and Learn. You can also listen to it on the Grow and Learn podcast and see the whole, hear the whole story of how Lion came to be as a professional, as an ex expert in clearing beliefs, in consciousness, in everything that he does. But I want to hear now about something that, is, that I'm also very curious about because it's aligned with my values. And this is men's circles, women's circles, returning to the authentic man, the authentic woman. Am I coming close to what the tribe of men is about? Lion? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> how, do we, how do we become more ourselves in community? How do we help each other become more honest, in integrity, authentic, all of that? Yeah, it's it's such an important topic. And Women got started with in the early feminist days where women gathered together and talked about the things that were happening. And I think the men got jealous uh, because a few men started men's groups, you know, to sort of follow on. Well, if the women are doing it, we should do it too. Uh, and that was uh, in the very early days of the men's movement. And that has blossomed into some very large organizations, lots of small circles, and men are getting together to help each other become better men. Okay. So how long ago did, this, did you start this movement? Because you started it. You're the founder of the Tribe of Men. Uh, well, I'm the founder of a particular organization called the Tribe of Men, but I've been involved in the men's movement for about, how old am I now? Uh, for about 40 years. Uh, and that was the early days of the men's movement. Uh, there were people like Robert Bly, the poet who was writing beautiful books about men's work. And there were a few very, very important psychologists and uh, and community members that said, we have a story too. The story of men is uh, mythic. Uh, you know, who have men been? Who have we been? What are, what are our roles that we've been forced to play? And not everybody fits into those roles. And so what happens to the outliers? What happens to the people who aren't big macho guys who can protect and defend uh, and why are we protecting and defending and who got us into those positions in the first place. So uh, the, the movement started as a mythopoetic movement where we were looking at myths and trying to understand the history of men and the, and the places we were put, the roles we were put into and how injurious they were to who we are as people. In the same way that women were put into specific roles and, you know, the the, the barefoot wife at home, you know, having babies, uh, that was as injurious to women as men have to go off and, and be uh, fodder in, in the war against some other tribe. So it was really examining all of these ways that humans have been channeled into particular roles and, and behaviors that are not who we are. They're just old stories. And when you say that you examine this, is this a developing process or did you kind of define already the, the characteristics, the values, everything that defines a man? Do you have this as a set of characteristics of what is a man? Well, this is a question that we bring up in our men's circles, which is what really constitutes a man? What are the myths and the beliefs? I'm a specialist in beliefs. What do we believe we're supposed to be? How are we programmed by our parents and our culture and our society and our religion to be a certain way? 
And is that true? You used the word authentic before. Is that truly us? Or is that just a program that we adopted? Uh, so think about elementary school. You know, there's the bully kids, the kids that have become the tough guys. Uh, and then there's the victims who get pummeled by the bullies. And there's the observers. And, and then there's cliques in junior high school where you know, a gaggle of women get together and a gaggle of men get together and there's the football players and then there's the the geeks and there's <laughs> the nerds. And, you know, and so we we, t we are tribal, tribal beings. We tend to want to be like people like us. And so we, t we naturally tend toward moving into these groups. And once you move into a group, you adopt their beliefs and their behaviors, and then you leave who you really are behind when you start becoming like you are expected to act, big boys don't cry. This is a, an example of a belief that got, got pummeled into us as children. You know, stop crying, be a man, uh, you know, no pain, no gain. This is uh, a, a way of channeling boys into a particular kind of manhood. And when we really examine it, we find out that it was false, that it was just a belief set. It was just a role that was laid on top of us and that we had to adjust to fit in. So this happens to, to girls and women as well. Um, it's just that the men had to figure it out on their own as the women had to figure it out on their own. What are some significant differences that you've discovered between the authentic men and the men from popular culture? apart mm. from uh, men don't cry. Well, we have the superheroes uh, of the comic books and the movies, right? The, the man who comes in and, and defends the, the people against the evildoers and, uh, and we use weapons and you know we get military gear, boys get guns and play cowboys and Indians. It's us, them. It's like there's us against them. And our job is to kill them whoever them is. And this is one of the earliest programs that has created wars for thousands of years. There's an us and there's a them. And so our job as men is to be the defenders and the aggressors and the dominators against them, whoever them is. Even in farming, the them is the insects. And so we, we get killer pesticides to kill those evil insects that are eating our crops when in fact insects are important pollinators and we now know you know in a natural world insects have their role um and so uh this idea that we are to dominate that we are to aggress uh, is just ancient programming and it's it's caused more wars and and destruction than it has caused goodness you know, if, if a tribe is being aggressed upon, then you need defenders. But if there's no aggressors, let's live happily ever after. You know? mm -hmm. So there, there's history, there's known history that, that of matriarchs, for example, before the masculine uh, um, myths came in and took over. Uh, matriarchal societies likely were uh, peaceful and were generous and were, were prosperous. And then these these uh, hordes from the north came in and basically took over overthrew the goddess culture, and especially when you when you bring in the Abrahamic religions of Judaism and then Christianity and then Islam, really destroyed the feminine culture. And God was a man, so God told us what to do, and God told us to dominate and aggress and to kill you if you don't agree with us. So this is really the history of humanity this idea that we we there's not enough so we need more so we'll go and aggress you and take over whatever you have so anyway we're dealing with with an entire cultural history for thousands of years not just what today's society uh programs us i i recently have a, had a conversation that also touched on um, matriarchies, and that was uh, in regards to AI. So how society is developing, some would say cyclically, some would say cyclically and upward, you know, uh, uh, developing in a different direction. But would you say that 
it was anyhow a natural movement and a part of human learning that these matriarchies were replaced by a more aggressive culture so that we can finally, uh, or not finally, but take out the learning from this experience as well. And what is the next learning in the development of this um, dance between the masculine and the feminine? Well, there are many good books uh, written by people much smarter than I am about the history of the of the masculine and the feminine and patriarchy and, and matriarchy. Um, but it's clear that that in a matriarchy, there were problems. And in a patriarchy, there's a lot of problems. So our goal, from my understanding of, of where we have been and where we're going, is to find a way to work together as males and females, as masculine and feminine, in the, in Asia, they have the Tao. the The Tao has a little bit of feminine inside the masculine and a little bit of masculine inside the feminine, and it's a flowing circle with with two you know fish like interconnected parts. And that is uh, that is the way we we are designed to work together and to bring out the best in each other, not to dominate or control each other. And matriarchies may have been controlling in one way and patriarchies were controlling in another way. But we have to stop trying to control each other and rather to, to raise each other up into the glorious beings that, that each individual is. Um, uh, I, in my study of history, I read about the Native Americans and um, in a book called Hanta Yo, uh, the, the tribe would look at a new child with great anticipation and wonder how is this child going to grow up to be themselves and to contribute to the tribe. So a little boy might be good with an arrow. So he may grow up to be a great hunter to bring meat back for the tribe. A girl might be a great basket weaver and she would be making baskets for the tribe. Everyone had their role in the tribe as a whole, but also their own individual genius. And so when we look at children and we see, we, we look with anticipation and say, how is this child going to express their genius, their individual unique genius? That's a different way of looking at it than saying, you, are, you need to be a warrior. You need to be a hunter. You need to be a basket maker. You need to be a cook. So uh, it's not an imposed uh, structure, but rather one that, that allows each person to express themselves fully. And if we are in a cooperative society and we're all there for ourselves and each other, that's where we're going to create a sustainable civilization where everyone gets their needs taken care of. Uh, this reminds me a lot of um, a book by Vladimir Begre. It's actually quite famous. It has to do with communities, which is a subject that we briefly talked about. And it talks about the Vedic culture, but not the Vedic Indian culture. Uh, it, it was rather a world widespread culture um, that was called the Vedic culture, just coincidentally uh, with, the, with what we know as Vedic astrology from India. Anyhow, so in this Vedic culture that existed more than 10,000 years ago, according to the uh, heroine of the book the main purpose of the mother was actually to discover as you're saying it was the culture of the native americans the main purpose of the mother was to discover what the talents of the child are nothing else not to provide it food i mean naturally this of course but the main role of women was to see and nurture the talents of the child Beautiful. Exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. 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 And in that kind of society, every individual is seen and respected for who they are, regardless of how they are or who they are. In Native American culture, they had two spirits. These were men who liked to dress as women or, you know, women who liked to, to do the activities of men. And today we call them gay and lesbian, but, but the Native Americans, they were sacred people because they had two spirits. So there's a history of, of sacredness of each kind of person. Every person has a contribution to make. Now, spiritually, we know this, but the society doesn't know this yet. Society is still based on 10,000 years of bad programming. 
And so we have to sort of fight against that programming. We have to dig out the beliefs that are false inside of ourselves in order to become truly authentic. And this is what we do in our men's circles. It's what women do in women's circles. And there's also couple circles where we're, we're trying to work out this problem that we've all been programmed with false beliefs, false myths, false roles, and to find our truth and our authenticity again. Who am I really? How do I show up? How do I relate to other people? And, and am I relating in a way that is supportive of the whole? Or is it detrimental to the whole or detrimental to myself? So these are the more important questions. They're the moral and ethical questions that we need to ask for ourselves and in community both. You wrote a book called Men Lightment. Just yes. to show the cover. A book for awakening men. What is the book about? Uh, this book I wrote many, many years ago in the early days of, of the men's movement. And it was basically a way for men to become better men. And uh, the original idea was if if you want to attract a really good woman, become a better man. <laughs> the, mm. So it was kind of counter to the uh, pickup artist uh, uh, movement that was happening. Like, hey, here's how to go get women in, in bars and get their phone numbers and start dating them and having sex with them. I was saying, hey, if, if you want that, nothing wrong with that. But if you want that, become a better man. Don't just learn how to use pickup lines. <laughs> so <laughs> it was basically a, a lot of different suggestions for how to become a better man. Join a men's group, take an initiation program, uh, study psychology, study your own psychology, uh, dance, do yoga. <laughs> so it's really all the suggestions for how a man can find his way in a relational world that is attractive to a real relationship to a, a sincere and, and good relationship uh, rather than just going out and getting sex when you want it. Mm -hmm. Would you then say that it's very similar to a woman finding herself? Would this book serve a woman just as well, or is it specifically targeted to men? What well, is the it was, difference? It was written for, it was written for men uh, because there are certain resources that men need that are different than a woman woman needs. Women naturally tend to get together into groups and it's easier for them to do that. Men have uh, are trained to be individuals. And so individual when you're trained to be individualistic, the rugged individual is one of the myths of Western culture. You know, John Wayne, you know, going out and killing the Indians and uh, and uh, killing the bad guys. Uh, that culture still infuses us in many ways. Now we have the the uh, Elon Musk's of the world, the the super rich entrepreneurs. They're now the rugged individuals who have done it their way, and they decide, and they're. They're the, you know, we we put them in this uh, glorious position and worship them almost like gods and goddesses. Um, but we need to bring all that down and say, how do we relate to each other as people? How do men need to relate to men? Not see them as competitors, but see them as brothers. How do we relate? Re, how do we relate to women? Not seeing them as something, someone to conquer, but a partner. It, it's a partnership culture rather than a domination culture. So yes, there's many suggestions that would serve women uh, in that book, but it's primarily written for the male mind. Mm -hmm. and, and so would you say that this inclination of men to be more individualistic is also programmed or is it an innate uh, brain structure? Because this is what I've also read in whatever this book was, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I think there was That's... one book and there was a continuation. It was the difference of the structure of the male and the female brains yeah john yeah. Gray's work yeah mm -hmm. yeah he's he's a, a friend of mine uh so this question of nurture or nature has been around in psychology for a long time how much is inborn instinct or brain structure how much is socialized and culturalized and everything i've read comes down to it's about 50 50 uh -huh. that part of it is our internal structure Men have a, a brain uh, in a lot of ways driven by testosterone. Women have a brain primarily 
uh, oriented toward uh, uh, progesterone and and uh, uh, and estrogen. and so estrogen. Thank you. Um, and so we certainly have those instincts biologically, culturally, individually, socially, uh, religiously. We are packed with with tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of beliefs on top of the structure that's already there. And so we're complicated beings. And this is why in my clear beliefs method, we treat a being as a multidimensional being, having multidimensional experiences, which form multidimensional beliefs. We're complicated. Uh, and so uh, everything we can do to move ourselves forward toward more authenticity, toward more spirituality, toward more communing with other people and, and working with others and making it making community. Every step counts. Every step is important. So, uh, you know, how do you fix people? You don't. You just get them on the right path and keep them on the path. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And so talking about that, <laughs> not fixing people, but keeping them on the right path, you mentioned your uh, um, recovering narcissist. I did, yes. What so, does that really mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> How did you discover that, first of all? Well, it's sort of like being a recovering alcoholic. You never get over being an alcoholic. You're just constantly recovering. Uh, narcissism is a very long spectrum. Uh, and we have to first acknowledge this, that uh, people are now using the word narcissist to kind of apply to anybody that thinks about themselves. Uh, let's throw that out because it doesn't work. Narcissism is a long spectrum and it means self-care, self-focus. So at one end of the healthy spectrum, when you take good care of your body, you're, you're self-focused for the benefit of your body and your life. That's not harming anyone. It's you're being good to yourself. All the way at the other end of the spectrum is toxic narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder. That's a psychological disease that that some people have that where they are only self-focused. They see other people as simply tools to use in to to aggrandize themselves. And that's dangerous. Now, that's a very long distance from one to the other. We're all somewhere on that spectrum. And women tend to be more communal caring and men tend to be more individualistic and self thinking, self caring, uh, taking care of self first. And so you first you have to find yourself on that spectrum. Okay, well, I, how much do I think about myself each day versus how much do I think about other people each day? You could find that balance. Each individual could ask that question, find their own place. And say, okay, I'm I'm there on the spectrum. Where do I want to be? Well, I want to be in the middle. I want to think about myself and the other person, not myself or the other person. Uh, now, interestingly, codependency is a similar long spectrum from, uh, yeah, I think about the other person every once in a while to I only think about the other person's needs and, and make sure they're taken care of. And narcissists and codependents often get together because they both agree on who's the most important person. The mm. narcissist says I am, and the codependent says you are. <laughs> mm. So um, so when I, uh, I never thought of myself as a narcissist. I always thought of myself as someone who takes care of himself. And also, I'm good in relationship, right? I was together with very powerful women. We had good relationships. But if I decided to do something, I'd go do it. I wouldn't really consider what my partner had to say about it. Um, and one of my partners handed me a, an article one day that was about narcissism. And I read it and I went, oh, my God, that's me. <laughs> it was quite a shock. <laughs> uh, and that began my my research, because whenever I get interested in something, I start researching it. So I was reading books and articles on narcissism, trying to understand it. And I saw that most of my behavior, even in relationship, was oriented toward my own decisions, my own ideas, my what I wanted and needed. And the, uh, the other person really came second. But I cared about the other person. I cared if I hurt her, for example. I would feel bad. I'd apologize. I'd try to fix it. Um, but I, I wasn't thinking about their needs all the time. So I began a program of basically self-improvement 
around this idea that I need to be caring about the other person at least as much as I care about myself. And that is my recovery path. So uh, really considering the other person. So my relationship now is with the woman who's a specialist in attachment theory, psychology, and, and narcissistic behavior. So she's helped me a lot in waking me up to my own narcissistic tendencies. You know, um, I'm, I'm uh, taken off for the weekend. Uh, what about me? <laughs> she would ask. Yeah. And I would think, oh, I forgot to think about you. <laughs> so <laughs> let me rethink that. <laughs> let me come back and re rethink the conversation, rethink my plans. Uh, what is your need this weekend? You know, so so that's what the recovery process is. It's really orienting yourself toward the relationship rather than toward yourself. And do you feel that your clear belief system works well with the recovery process of narcissism as well? Absolutely, because we can dive into the ego in all of its glory uh, and find the programming, the original programming that began that the pattern, whatever pattern is showing up. So narcissism as a pattern comes partly from the culture, you know, just go, go get it yourself. And you're, you're the most, you're, you need to be a winner and, uh, you know, no pain, no gain, and just go out and be successful. You know, that's the most important thing. That part of the masculine programming tends to make us into narcissists. Uh, and, and the narcissists are celebrated. As I said, you know, Elon Musk, the ultimate narcissist, uh, Donald Trump, the ultimate narcissist, these are people who are celebrated in our culture because narcissists can be very successful because they don't care about anybody else except their own success. So, uh, so we're fighting against a culture that celebrates narcissism uh, in, to come back into balance. Mm. But then I've heard that there are also these um, covert narcissists that are neither ambitious nor seem to care too much about themselves but they still you know make their will through or push their will through using manipulative i mean they're all manipulative but like covert ways to get what they want sure Maybe, gaslighting yeah. gaslighting exactly. is one of those yeah. ways manipulation exactly. and control um, there's lots of ways that a narcissist can make the other person seem like they're crazy uh, mm -hmm. when act they're actually saying and the narcissist is being a narcissist so yeah it's uh it's tricky and that's why i wrote the book the narcissism primer for men yeah. and I'm for women to show it yeah uh mm -hmm. to understand these these core principles uh so uh this, you can see the illustration there it's you can see the narcissist being illustrated me and then sort of everybody <laughs> Whirling around me, you know, so yeah, um, stuff about me, stuff I hate, others, <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere, yeah. Oh, no. nice. So this is uh, to this one. Is this where people can get the book from? Confusedaboutlove.com. Yes. About love .com? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Primer. Yeah. And, and so, and what does the book help you do? to be aware of and how to deal with narcissism or how to deal with nar narcissists? Oh, it's it's for, it was written for men again, and it's for men to recognize their own narcissism. Um, women tend to call men narcissists and for good reason. Um, but my recommendation is that if you're a woman that you want your man to read this, print it out, leave it somewhere and and don't talk to him about it let him find it and he'll say what's this you go oh, it's just something that showed up and walk away don't talk about him don't tell him he needs to read this because that will he will you are telling him he's a narcissist and you're trying to fix him and he will not like it so let him cover it for himself <laughs> oh that's a very good tip <laughs> um so so where is the um the movement the tribe of men at the moment what is what is the size what is the status what are your activities uh, there are some very large organizations for example the mankind project that uh, have initiation processes for men and initiation is a really important aspect of the men's movement um, in tribal times boys were taken out of their mother's home or tent or teepee and taken into the woods 
and something horrible would happen to them in order to turn them into a man. Uh, in, in some cultures, the, uh, the men would uh, put on masks and, and uh, costumes and show up at the door. And the, the mother who was in on the, on the joke would say, no, no, don't take my little boy. He's my little boy. He's my son. You can't take him. They were, we are here to take your boy and turn him into a man. And they would take him out. The boy was incredibly frightened. Uh, and then he would be marched into the woods and sat down on a red ant hill or something. He would be put through an initiation process. And if he survived, and most did, but not all, <laughs> then then he would then be initiated into manhood. Say, okay, you're now a man. Now you live with the men. You don't live with your mommy anymore. You are a man now. You're part of the men's tribe and you are part of the society and you will do what we do. You will be a scout at the front lines of our of our territory or you will be a hunter or you will you will participate in men's activities. And so that was an important transition from boy to man. But along the lines of our cultural history, that got lost. That initiation pro process got lost. And it's really important. So today we have 30-year-old boys, you know, who are still in living with their mother and playing video games in the basement, um, which means it's an, an uninitiated man, basically. And so all of these men's organizations have come up with their own initiation processes. The Mankind Project is one of my favorites. They've initiated uh, tens of thousands of men around the world. Um, and then they have men's groups that are formed after the initiation process so that the men can continue their inner development. Uh, there's another organization called Every Man, spelled E-V-R-Y-M-A-N, not E-V-E-R-Y, but E-V-R-Y. And uh, they're teaching men how to feel how to find their bodies and to feel their emotions and identify their emotions. That's a very important initiation for, for boys who have been told not to feel, you know, if you cry on the football field, you are, you know, you're shamed. If you cry at all, you're shamed. So you have to stuff the emotions and you have to you know, put on a mask and pretend you're someone else. Um, there's many other organizations uh, out there, but, those are just some of the larger organizations. The Tribe of Men is a smaller organization that I helped found about 25 years ago. Uh, and we have about 100 men uh, around, mostly in the Bay Area, around San Francisco, but also uh, we've opened it up to, to men everywhere. And that's that's tribeofmen.com if people want to check that out. And we were it was formed by four of us who had all done a lot of inner work. And so we made it based on how to really go deep inside yourself and bring out the truth, bring out your authenticity, clear the stuff that's in the way. So it's very much a process-oriented uh, group. There's some groups that do, you know, um, uh, projects, you know, go build houses for people. Um, there's some that, that uh, just talk about what's happening. So you have to find your way into the right group if you're looking for one, because there's many different kinds of men's groups. But uh, there's plenty of them out there. You could just put men's groups in in Google and find hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about initiation got me thinking about the compulsory army service. I don't know if you've ever had this in, in the US, but in Europe, it, it, it is still um, present in some countries. In most countries, it was abolished. But uh, that was when, when they said, now you're becoming a man, because that's when you start um, experiencing hardship. But I'm also thinking whether this really constitutes a man. Do they really need to go through hardship and why men do, but women don't? Is this still well, the... Women, yeah. First of all, I think women have their own hardship to go through, even with menstruation and, and childbearing. That's mm -hmm. enough for any lifetime. <laughs> That's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they have to also deal with men, which is also an initiation of, themself, of itself. Um, uh, I don't know what it is about boys. Uh, I've been part of an organization called uh, the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, which is an initiation process for boys to turn them into young men. There's really three phases. There's the boy stage where you're doing what your parents tell you. There's the, the young man stage where you're either rebelling against mom and dad or you're, you know, you're joining a gang to, you know, to try to become a man. And then there's men. So we were initiating boys into young men and giving them some standards of behavior, giving them an understanding of ethics and, and morals and how to be an upright 
person. Uh, part of that program is what we call the the worst day of your life. And we'd sit in circle around the fire and talk. Everybody has a worst day of their life. And for some, it's seeing their best friend shot and killed on the streets. For others, it, it's, uh, you know, the parents getting divorced or a parent dying uh, and uh, giving boys a chance to really go down deep and share the most horrible parts of their life. And then we do a process in which they push against against men and and get out all their buried emotions. It's very dramatic. And uh, it it's really a release of all the stuff they've had to stuff down their whole lives. So that's an example of not a difficult initiation in terms of physically, but emotionally. And boys need to be supported by men to really get all that crap out of them because they've been pushing stuff down for decades. Mm -hmm. And how does it relate to women, the, what you're discovering about men and in, in your particular organization, the tribe of men? In the inner introspective work, what have, what have you discovered about the relationship, men, women, and what are you talking about? I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the topics that is brought up a lot is the relationship I'm in, the relationship with my children, the relationship with my spouse, the relationship with my parents. So relationship, we are relational animals. We we are troop animals, basically. You know, if, if, monk, if a monkey gets pushed out of the troop, they're dead meat. Uh, they'll be picked off by the nearest predator. So we have instinctually a need for community, a need for tribe or troop, right? Um, and we we are born into our first troop, which is our family. And in order to belong, we become like the others. Because if you want to belong to a group, you have to become like those other people, take on their beliefs, take on their mannerisms, take on their behaviors. And so this is another very powerful instinct is to belong. And children will take on the beliefs of their parents so they can be aligned with them. Because if they believed something else or they behaved a different way, they could be thrown out to the wolves. So one this belonging instinct tends has us tend to become like the people we hang out with and so depending on whether you get together with the the cool kids or the smart kids or the the bad kids <laughs> uh, the rebellious kids or the weird kids like we find our place in the social order uh, and then we tend to get stuck there and we because we've taken on those behaviors and beliefs and then we become like that and that becomes our personality well, what we're doing in, in our tribe and in, in many tribes is to really get rid of that old programming and find the true self. And when you're in the true self and you're in relationship with someone who's in their true self, then you can have a real relationship. You're both authentic. You're both honest. You can talk about anything that comes up and deal with it because there are problems in every relationship. There is no perfect relationship, but at least you have tools to deal with it. And then you can get through anything together. How can people become members of your organization, the Tribe of Men? Well, they can go to tribeofmen.com and, uh, and learn about it, learn what our principles are. And if they're aligned with the principles, uh, we have um, drop-in groups where you can come and meet some of the other people. Uh, and every men's group has that format. So if, if you are a man and you want a men's group, Look up men's groups, look up uh, the Mankind Project, Tribe of Men, uh, uh, Every Man, and just find the one that's right for you. It's the same as looking for a therapist. You have to shop around until you find the right one. Mm -hmm. Is this an online group or do you meet in the Bay Area? No, we, we started out uh, uh, in person groups and then we moved online during the pandemic and some groups are mixed now. There are some online, some in person and some half and half. Yeah. Very, very cool. You also have an upcoming in September. I checked your website last time, a coaching program for uh, co existing coaches who want to learn your clear belief system. Yes. Yes, I do. It's called uh, the yes. clear beliefs, clear beliefs coach training. And I've trained over 600 people around the world for, in 45 countries on this methodology for going very deep into the psyche and clearing out those old beliefs, clearing out 
the the programs that were badly programmed in childhood, um, and uh, we we have uh, we we have level one trainings about every other month, and then we have a level two and a level three program. In total, it's about twenty weeks of training. Uh, it, it's accredited by the International Coaching Federation and also the Association for Coaching. So it's an accredited training program for coaches, therapists, healers, and consultants who want to go deep with their clients. And uh, it's we call it therapeutic coaching because it's not therapy and it's beyond coaching. It's meta coaching. <laughs> it's coaching mm -hmm. at a very deep and profound level. So uh, the way people can find out about that is clearbeliefs.com. Mm -hmm. Lion, what's what's the best thing about the the men's tribe that you've experienced mm. about starting it and being a part of it, running it? Well, it's it's such a rich area. It's hard to fish out the best thing because the best thing is probably the deep relationships that you develop with other men uh, that are not a sexual romantic relationship. They are deep friendships, uh, friendships that go beyond just being friends. It, it's being a partner in inner development. And we are completely honest with each other. We tell the truth to each other. If someone's being false, we call them on it. So it's a place to, to find your authentic self and to be your best self. And that's what's best about any men's group, in particular, the tribe of men, because that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Well, thank you very much for enlighten enlightening us on the tribe of men movement and on the movements of men in general. Your book is again called Men Lightenment. Yes, Men Lightenment, right? Men Lightenment, yes. Yes. Uh, I had it somewhere here, but yeah, Men Lightenment. If people Google it, they'll be able to find it. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was a pleasure. I was going to say as always, but we've only talked twice, but it's a pleasure. Well, <laughs> okay. so far, it's it's every time. So yes. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a true delight to be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you for listening to Grow and Learn. We hope that you found our podcast informative, engaging, and inspiring. Our mission is to help you keep growing and learning, and we hope that our conversations and insights have provided you with practical advice and useful perspectives. If you're looking for personalized support and guidance to help you achieve your personal or professional growth objectives, I offer a range of services to help. As a trusted management partner and mentor, I work with businesses in the process of transformation, looking for new streams of business, as well as M&A. With an extensive professional network of experts and mentors, I can bring on board the right person or team based on the specific needs of the company I'm working with. To learn more about the services I offer and how I can help you achieve your goals, visit my website at growandlearn.org. You can also reach out to me via email or social media. I'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this episode of Grow and Learn, please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. Your feedback is important to us and it helps us to continue to create content that is relevant and valuable to our listeners. Thanks again for listening and we look forward to sharing more insights and perspectives with you in the future.